Okay, we're recording now. So Nathan, thank you ever so much for joining me to um, chat about all things Princes in the Tower for HistFest lockdown, as I've um, called it. Um, you are a historian, obviously, but you're also the author of The House of Beaufort, um, which is a brilliant book that anybody watching this should buy um, to find out more about the history. Um, but yeah, thank you. And how are you doing? Uh, I'm doing fine, thank you. You're doing good. Okay, so shall we start? Yeah, perfect. Okay, so who were the princes and what kind of life had they led up until the point that they disappeared? Well, the two princes were uh, Edward V and Richard of Shrewsbury, and they were the two sons of King Edward IV. Um, Edward IV, of course, um, became King of England in 1461 by uh, conquering, usurping, uh, whatever phraseology you want to use, uh, the House of Lancaster. Uh, Edward IV replaced Henry VI on the throne. Um, and Edward IV ruled for 10 years before he lost his throne uh, back to the Lancastrians for a period of about eight months. During that time, Edward IV uh, was forced into exile and he left England. And during his exile, his wife, Elizabeth Woodville, gave birth to the prince, you know, the, the future hope of the House of York. And that was the future Edward V. Um, Edward IV came back to England and retook his throne in 1471. And he ruled um, quite peacefully for the next 12 years. And during that time, of course, he had the two sons, uh, Edward and Richard. And very much these two children were supposed to be that great hope of mm. York. You know, Edward was now supreme um, on his throne. He had no challenges left, or no serious challenges. And it was certainly envisioned, envisioned that with his two sons, you know, the House of York would rule um, for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, as to what kind of life the boys had, I mean, the younger son, Richard, there's not too much known, um, as tends to be the case with younger sons during that time. But the eldest son, Edward, um, the future Edward V, he was sent to Ludlow at the age of just two years old, um, where it was anticipated that he would, uh, you know, learn what it was, what it was to become uh, a king of England, you know, even though he was still a baby at that time. <laughs> they get them young, don't they? Yeah, they got get them young, you know, ship them straight out from London up to the <laughs> Um And it's quite interesting because the man that Edward, King Edward, Edward IV, um, designated to look after his son was his brother-in-law, Anthony Woodville. Now, the Woodvilles get a bit of a bad deal in history, but I think everybody is, in, you know, in, in agreement, Anthony Woodville in particular, was a fascinating man. Uh, he was a very, you know, he was a learned scholar, uh, one of the greatest jousters of his age, and it was he who it was expected would be would raise this future king. Um, and yeah, Prince Edward was given, you know, a virtuous learning in Ludlow, where it was hoped in time, you know, he would reach adolescence or adulthood and be ready to be a king. Um, Unfortunately, things didn't quite work out uh, as planned. So everything was in place. There was this kind of this perfect dynasty in place. You had two sons. You had the heir and the spare. Um, the boy, the eldest, was already being trained up to be a king, even though he was still tiny by well today's standards. But as I said, they did get them young then, didn't they? Um, but the one kind of elephant, well, not elephant in the room, but the one thing that I, as an outsider to the medieval period, that I am always a, very aware of, even by just osmosis, is the power play and the fact that the houses of York and Lancaster, and even internally, were always at each other's throats. So, can you tell me a bit more about that? About what was going on behind the scenes? Well, I mean, everything was perfect, so to speak. You know, as you say, Edward had the air and the spare, um, and everything was running smoothly. But the problem was Edward the Fourth himself. Um, you know, he was um, 
a strapping young man when he came to the throne. Um, he let himself go very quickly once his throne was secure. And he died on the 9th of April, 1483, at the age of 40. He grew extremely fat. Mm -hmm. uh, he was constantly eating, constantly drinking. And it was actually something that was, that was shared by his grandson, Henry VIII. Um, you know, these two fine specimens who just let themselves go. I mean, it happens to the best of us, I guess. But, <laughs> you, you know, as a king, this was dangerous because Edward died at just 40 and his two boys were 12 and nine years old. And he left behind uh, a divided court. Now, now his court, to simplify things, there were two real factions at play. There was the Woodfill faction, you know, um, his wife's family, um, the parents and the and the paternal uncles, or maternal uncles rather, of the young boys. And then there were the king's own brothers. So our brother, that was Richard of Gloucester, the future Richard III. Things moved very quickly once Edward was out of the way, because, you know, in theory, with the two boys being underage, the power should pass um, to the king's brother, Richard of Gloucester, yeah. to rule as a protector, should we say. The Woodfields didn't want that to happen. And there definitely was a power struggle at play over who should look after. Because whoever was in control of the young boy king had the power. You know, it, it was, that, that was just the, the case. So what, what happened was the young Prince Edward, now Edward V, was in Ludlow with his un uncle Anthony Woodville, and they started travelling to London for the coronation. Um, because as soon as that boy king was crowned, all the power was then in who controlled the boy. And at this yeah. point, it was... On the 29th of April, so a couple of weeks after Edward V, Edward IV had died, um, the young boy king and his uncle Anthony Woodville were in Stony Stratford. And it was there that they were intercepted by Richard of Gloucester. So you had these two uncles of the boy king. Now on the surface, they acted as if everything was, you know, well, and they shared dinner. But in the morning, when Anthony Woodville woke up, he was arrested and sent to the north. Richard of Gloucester took control of the boy, um, and then took him to London himself. So he was now in control of the king. And things moved quickly here because, um, you know, they arrived in London at the start of May. Um, within a couple of weeks, the 27th of May, Richard of Gloucester was formally declared the protector. So he had pretty much usurped the power of the Woodfills to take control of the boy king and be named protector. And this was to be expected, to be, to be fair to Richard. You know, he was a royal prince himself. Yeah. You know, he was the boy's uncle. He didn't know the boy very well. That was for the other uncle who had raised um, the boy king. But things took a quick turn on the 13th of June. We're still within, you know, a two-month period of one king dying because Richard held a council meeting in the Tower of London. And during that council meeting, he suddenly started shouting out that treason had occurred and ordered a lot of the councillors there to be arrested. One of them in particular, William, William Hastings, uh, Edward IV's best friend, Richard Hardin executed there and then. Oh, wow. He, you so know, he's getting rid of any potential opposition. He was, that's one reading of it. Oh, uh, okay. that, that's my reading of it. Uh, my reading is, yeah, he was... He was getting rid of any potential opponents to it to really secure his power. Now, I don't think that means he was trying to usurp the throne. Mm -hmm. I don't think he was at this point had any grand designs like, you know, like Shakespeare and people like that would have us believe. I think Richard had just dug himself into a hole and was kind of making his haphazard steps all along the way and was digging himself into a corner. Um, he executed Hastings on the 13th of June. Three days later, uh, so he already had the king, the boy king, in his control. The brother, Richard of Shrewsbury, had since been taken into sanctuary 
at Westminster Abbey by the boy's mother, Elizabeth Woodville. Richard of Gloucester, the uncle, surrounded Westminster Abbey with all his soldiers and pretty much made Elizabeth hand over her sons. So that is how Richard got hold of the two princes um, at that point into his control. Now, once he had them in his control, Sorry, did you, did no, I was just going to say, and then, then, yeah, I was going to ask you what happened after that point. Then, what, what, what was the next stage of the story? So, so the twenty-first of June, Richard has them both in his power. Suddenly, on the twenty-second of June, the very next day, um, a preacher named Ralph Shaw appears at St Paul's Cathedral and starts declaring that the two princes were actually illegitimate. And he based it on the fact that it had suddenly come to light that Edward IV, the boy's father, had been secretly married before he had married their mother, Elizabeth Woodville. Okay, classic so move. Classic move. <laughs> yeah, well, it's very convenient. You know, it, it could legitimately be true. There's a lot of debate surrounding whether it was or wasn't true. But the timing, you know, it's very convenient that Richard's just got him into his control and the very next day suddenly these children are, are bastards and as they're bastards they suddenly had no right to the throne so if the two boys are no longer legitimate well who's going to be king and that's what happened four days later um the lords of the land the clergy they all approached Richard III Richard of Gloucester and asked him to become king and that's how Richard became uh, King Richard III so, so you know the, the timeline is very important there. it's very things are happening very quickly and with each step that's happening Richard just finds his way onto the throne now you know depending where you fall on the debate of Richard III this was either him doing what was best for the country and, you know, it wasn't his fault that the children were bastards. That was Edward the Force. Mm -hmm. Extreme point, Richard was an evil tyrant who had planned this all along. I think the truth is very much in the middle. He's just a man like, like me today who simply doesn't have hindsight of what my actions are going to do. You know, we, we act in a manner every day. A politician certainly, more than perhaps, you know, me sitting in my house, they don't know what they're doing today, how it's going to play out in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, and I think that's just simply what happened to Richard. I think he was trying to defeat his enemies at court to just secure his position and ended up on the throne. <laughs> um, well, it's quite, it's quite good luck for him. Um, but then, so we have the princes then and they're in the tower. Um, it's such an iconic story and it is a story because it's one of those things that even people not familiar with with the history of the medieval period will yeah. know the princes in the tower what happens to them that's the the key question uh we know that richard had them both in control and they were sent into the tower from there on we have some chroniclers evidence of what happened or, or what what they reported on mm -hmm. um you know, we had um, one chronicler say that they were seen that summer in the gardens of the tower playing. Uh, another chronicler says that they were seen alive at some point before November that year, and then they disappeared from view. Uh, an Italian in London at the time called Dominic Mancini, he said that he had heard rumours that they had been done away with, but he didn't know by who, and every time the name Edward V was mentioned around town, men just broke out in tears because they knew or they believed that he had died. Um, qu quite simply, they, they were around that summer, the summer of 1483, and then they, they disappeared, never to be seen again. Um, that brings us to the question of, you know, if they were killed, who killed them? Um, because Again, there's so many theories and suspects and and so on. Um, do, do you need 
towards any particular theory, I know it's very difficult when you're dealing with the subject of Richard III because he is a figure that has, um, you know, there are people that even today really do support Richard III and, and want to um, refresh his history because he has had a bad propaganda campaign throughout, you know, since yeah. Shakespeare onwards. But is it difficult as a historian to kind of say, um, yes, I think it was him or I think it was another? I mean, where do you sit on this, this question? I've had a lot of grief in the past, so I always preface this answer by saying nobody knows for certain and anybody who says they know who did it are quite simply, you know, they're not being honest. Um, the historian GM Trevelyan once said, history is a matter of uh, rough guessing from all of the known available facts. And I think with all of the known available facts, the evidence, human nature, I do generally believe Richard III killed the princess in the tower. Um, right. Bit unique in that people either think Richard was good, he didn't do it, or Richard was evil, he did it. I am in the middle where I think he was a good man of heart, could have been a good king, and I think he did this bad thing to protect his own lineage, and that doesn't make him a bad man. So I'm kind of saying he's a child murderer, but he's a good man, <laughs> and he did the right thing. And I think he did do the right thing because he was now the king, and he had his own son. His own son was about eight, nine years old at the time. And all Richard now needed to do was make sure his son became king after him. And that meant killing his nephews. It's, you know, we can't really get into that mindset. But what was he going to do? As I said, he backed himself in a corner and he was a product of the Wars of the Roses. He knew what happened when too many... You know, kings had too many sons, too many grandsons, and so on. War was going to happen. So people say these prince, these princes were not a threat to Richard III. No, they weren't at that time, at the age of 12 years old and 9 years old. But 10 years down the line, they're going to have people who are going to be fighting and waging war on their behalf against his own son. The right thing to do as a king of England and a father was to kill those princes. And that's where I come into play. For I seem to be the only one willing to go down that, you know, well done, you did the right thing for killing children. But So it's the logical step, cold hearted, cold hearted, yeah. and very, you know, uh, ruthless, but objectively the only option he really had. Would you say that's a fair? Yeah. Yeah, no king is going to let themselves and their, and their line have the chance to get knocked off the throne. I mean, Edward IV was the key man here who made sure that he took out all threats to the crown. People always bring up the Tudors, you know, the Tudors are famous for, for killing threats. And yes, Henry VIII, you know, he, he, he took off some heads in his time. But Edward IV almost initiated this when he became king. He took out quite a few Lancastrian uh, claimants to him. And the only one he never got his hands on was the young Henry Tudor. Um, and, you know, that, that came back and bit him. Um, although well, I guess Henry Tudor married Elizabeth of York. You know, it kind of worked for him. But... So that brings, I guess that brings me on to the next stage of this story. And I, I realise that we're pushed for time here, but if... If you have a few words on, because um, I know you've researched this extensively, on the impact of the death or disappearance of these princes and how the pretender Perkin Warbeck came into this story. Yeah, I mean, very simply, without the princes in the tower and without their disappearance, we wouldn't have the Tudors. Um, you know, their disappearance pretty much gave impetus to Henry Tudor, who at that time was some random Welshman exiled abroad with a very, very slim claim to the throne. You know, there was no way in hell Henry Tudor should have become King of England. But because of the prince's disappearance and, you know, the trouble that it caused, 
it gave Henry Tudor this chance to exploit it and become king. So that's their real leg to the princes. You know, they themselves, they were just boys. You know, they, they didn't leave a mark themselves. But their disappearance gave the Tudor dynasty their birth. And of course, their sister was Elizabeth of York, you know, mm -hmm. the mother of the Tudor dynasty. Um, because nobody ever found out what happened to them, you know, it was a disappearance, then yes, there were later pretenders who rose to challenge the Tudor claim, and one of those was Perkin Warbeck. Uh, Perkin claimed to be the younger of the princes in the tower. Uh, his latest story was that he was granted clemency when he was about to be executed by an assassin and was allowed to slip abroad. I think that's very unlikely. You, you know, no assassin is going to risk the wrath of their king <laughs> by letting a rival claimant slip away. Um, but I think the Perkin Warbeck story is compelling. I don't believe it. Um, but it's compelling enough to give it a, a popularity amongst... Um, amongst readers of, of history, you know, people want it to be true, so they cling to it. Uh, you get the same with, you, you know, Jack the Ripper. People want to believe that it was, uh, you know, a, a, a royal who, who was Jack the Ripper. Um, and yes, it would be nice to have believed that one of the princes had survived and lived out, you know, at least into adulthood. But I just think the weight of probability against it, you know, again, it's a very convenient story and i get very suspicious when things are too convenient <laughs> life doesn't work that way unfortunately well history doesn't work that way um, and if it does as you say it's very suspicious um nathan that's all we have time for i'm afraid but it's been really <laughs> fascinating talking to you and learning a bit about the princes in the tower and how they fit into the wider history of the Wars of the Roses, House of York, House of Lancaster. But as I said at the beginning, your book is called The House of Beaufort and it's available to be purchased now. Don't go out to the shops and buy it right now because we're in <laughs> lockdown, but um, you can buy it online, can't you, and um, all other places. Okay. But um, thank you ever so much for your time. No, thank you, cheers. Bye.